Okay, good morning everyone, and thank you for joining uh, greenbusinessowner.com for our monthly webinar. This month we have a very special guest and a presentation that I'm personally very excited about hearing. Uh, it's one that I um, heard a, uh, a version of when I was at the LOHAS conference in Boulder in June of this year. Uh, it's going to be presented by Gwyn Rogers, who is from the Natural Marketing Institute, and it's entitled Myth Busting testing 10 commonly held beliefs about the green consumer. Uh, if you have content questions uh, that can wait until the end, that would be great. If you want to, you can ask questions during the webinar as well and just go ahead and post those into the chat box on the right and we'll try and address those as they come up. Uh, this session is going to be recorded and is available for viewing on our website later. Uh, this will be announced in our next newsletter, so please make a note to allow emails from greenbusinessowner.com to pass through your spam filter uh, so that you can get these emails later on. I want to introduce Gwyn Rogers, our, our guest today. Uh, Gwyn, as I mentioned, uh, presented at the LOHAS conference in Boulder in uh, June of 2010. Her specialty is strategic analysis and planning for the LOHAS-related organizations. Uh, she has uh, a master's in environmental management and an MBA from Duke University. Uh, she's been working with the Natural Marketing Institute since 2002 and has been working for uh, large companies uh, and other organizations uh, with the U.S. government. Uh, including Ben Jerry's, Aveda, Aramark, ConAgra, DuPont, Honda, Ford, Weyerhaeuser, and the EPA. Uh, Gwyn is a, 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 an amazing presenter in person and uh, is an expert in understanding the Lojas consumer, so I'm sure this is going to be an incredibly valuable webinar for everyone today. Uh, Gwyn's employer, the Natural Marketing Institute, is an international strategic consulting market research and business development company specializing in health, wellness, and sustainable marketplace issues. Uh, so you can check out www.nmisolutions.com for more information. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Gwen. Welcome, Gwen. Thanks, Seth. Thanks, Seth. That was a nice intro. Um, and as Seth said, I am here to talk about this factors. And um, I will start with the and that is that I, I don't have cable and so I don't actually watch the show Mythbusters. Um, but I understand that it's very popular and uh, we're going to use their framework to talk through 10 um, uh, myths that uh, people commonly uh, have hold about the green marketplace. Um, but I also, the second disclaimer is that um, Mythbusters and the Mythbusters logo are definitely trademarks of discovery and uh, we don't want to infringe on their intellectual property rights there. So, sort of, if the, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Mythbusters um, concept, they test things like can you murder somebody by dropping an electrical appliance in the bathtub? And on the next page, you'll see if uh, the is it, the moon landing a hoax. The next one is about listing a truck by duct tape. Applying that logic to sustainability and consumers, these are the 10 myths that we are going to be exploring over the next. Uh, 45, 50 minutes. Um, the first is the idea that green is niche and only relevant to the small number of the pop, of, of consumers. Um, secondly, that low-house consumers are the primary target. For those of you who aren't familiar with the term low-house, it's an acronym that stands for Lifestyles of Health and Sustainability. So we talk about the low-house consumers, which is a portion of the population. We also talk about the low-house marketplace, uh, which is any green or socially conscious or healthy product that's sold. We'll talk more about that later. Um, so that's the second myth, that, that that portion of the population is the primary target. The third myth is that low-house consumers are driving your market growth. Fourth is that they are perfect consumers who do all things green all the time and they never stumble. Fifth, that sustainability will not survive the recession. Sixth, that Generation Y is driving the green movement. We get that question on, on a daily basis. Seventh myth is that the U.S. market is most opportunistic globally. Eighth, that the low-house segment will get larger and larger, and one day everybody will be a low-cost consumer. You get that a lot, too. This so number nine, that low-cost consumers buy primarily based on green criteria. And finally, number 10, that the CFR, that your CSR campaign is working and changing consumer behavior. Um, so going into myth number one, the green is myth. We look here at the uh, a couple different metrics to show um, that from a variety of angles, the green is not Niche. So there are a couple different examples here, a couple different angles that you can look at the size of the green um, marketplace. First is simply that if you look at the revenue of all the companies that have joined or um, partnered with the U.S. Climate Action 
partnership, it's $1.7 trillion in revenue. That's a significant amount of dollars, private sector dollars. They're uh, essentially voting um, in support of, of climate change um, regulation. Another way to look at that is to look at the percent or the magnitude of dollars invested in socially responsible investments, which is now more than 10% of all U.S. investments. Very significant. Um, just for perspective, that's larger than the percentage of organic food as a percentage of um, total food purchases. It's higher than the penetration of hybrids in the marketplace. Um, and overall represents about $2.7 trillion in investments. Certainly, I'm, I'm sure you guys are aware of some of the other sort of specific store uh, company examples, but Walmart's doing with its supplier card and uh, working on its supply chain and, and um, uh, working to get greener products on their shelves like Marine Stewardship Certified Tuna, Organic Cotton. CE, of course, has a huge investment into eco-imagination products, now standing at about $17 billion in sales. Um, Bank of America has invested $10 billion to support climate change related. Um, and, and the last example here is Forbesity, which is, uh, has just launched the uh, use of the hybrid. So those are just some examples to get your mind thinking about the consumer marketplace here. So on page eight, we can see the size of the U.S. consumer marketplace. And uh, I mentioned that we talked about the low cost consumer. Those, uh, that segment of the population is, is about 19% of U.S. adults. It's about 35 million consumers. They are active stewards of the environment. They're dedicated to personal and sanitary health. It's very much a lifestyle for that. They don't just products. They're active across a whole range of categories. Um, for a long time, um, I've been with NMI since 2002. All we really talked about was the wealth of consumer. But what we realized over the past couple of years is that Sometimes um, naturalized drifters or conventional can be good targets. So to understand a little bit more of them, let's just sort of go through their high-level descriptions. Uh, naturalites are about 15% of U.S. adults. They are primarily motivated by their own personal health, and so they look for products without artificial ingredients. So um, because they associate the purity of products without artificial ingredients as being better for their health. So that leads them to use uh, organic foods or natural personal care products or natural cleaning products. They have a little bit of trouble getting bought into green durables, um, but for a lot of CPG companies, they're a good target. Drifters are 25% of the population. They're looking for easy green products. They are also image conscious, and they want to be seen as a person who is doing his or her job to protect the environment. Um, and so they'll do things like carry reusable water bottles or take their bags to the grocery store because those are easy things that don't cost them any money and they get sort of green points for doing that. Conventionals are 24% of the population. They're a very practical consumer segment who is really most interested in saving money. Uh, but as we all know, a lot of times protecting the environment can be an effective approach. And so they are the kind of consumer that by CFLs and rechargeable light bulbs and energy appliances, but also rinses out the black bags or safe takeout containers to use as Tupperware. What you see is that as you move, um, and you think back a few years, as you go, we used to just talk about that 20% that was a low cost consumer, and it's really kind of flipped. But now we're talking about the 80% of the population who's involved in some way, shape, or form with sustainability. Those middle two segments are not nearly engaged as engaged as low cost consumers in the space, but they, uh, depending on your product category or the benefits that you can offer, still represent a viable target to consumers. So on page 10, there's yet another way to um, prove that green is not niche, and that's in the size of consumer spending. Um, the last time we measured this was uh, consumer spending in 2008, um, so 12 months ending in you know, December. And uh, by our estimation, consumers in the U.S. spent $290 billion, uh, billion with a B, on well-housed products and services. 